Hi, I'm Khalilo Reynolds and welcome to Taking Stock. We're bringing you all the latest business news and telling you how it will affect you and your money. But before we get started, head over to takingstock-ja.com to subscribe to our newsletter. You can click the link in the description box below. Our merch is here and we're now able to ship overseas. Email admin at kalilaraymedia.com to get yours. Come on, let's get this money. First up, Jamaica's first creative hub opened its doors in downtown Kingston over the weekend. They hope to appeal to persons who work in the creative and cultural industries. We'll find out more from co-founder and executive director at Kingston Creative, Andrea Dempster-Chung. And later, the analysts swain on the latest market developments. Aluminum refinery Jamalco is to list on the Jamaica Stock Exchange. And U.S. stock Tesla rose more than 300% since March despite COVID-19. It then jumped a further 5% on news of its latest earnings last week. We'll discuss. But first, here's What's Hot, brought to you by Jamaica Money Market Brokers, your best interest at heart. Sagicor Investments is getting a new boss as part of a restructuring by the parent company Sagicor Group. Tara Nunes takes over in the newly created post of general manager on August 3. Nunes is currently vice president for wealth management and client services at Sagicor Investments. Nunes will report directly to Sagicor Group president and CEO Christopher Zaka. Meanwhile, CEO and Executive Vice President of Sagico Investments Jamaica, Kevin Donaldson, is being made redundant under reorganization of the wealth subsidiary of the Sagico Group. In a statement issued by the group, Sagicor says Donaldson's positions are being abolished on July 31 as part of a strategic move. The Bank of Jamaica again intervened in the foreign exchange market on Friday with 30 million US dollars in a flash sale to authorized dealers and cambios through its foreign exchange intervention and trading tool BFixit. This is the third time this month the bank has intervened as part of efforts to stabilize the Jamaican dollar. It brings the total amount sold in July to 70 million US dollars. However, despite the central bank's assistance, the Jamaican dollar traded at an all-time high at the end of the week, selling for $147.99 to 1 US. Business confidence dipped to its lowest in five years in the second quarter of 2020. That's according to the latest confidence survey commissioned by the Jamaica Chamber of Commerce. Both the business and consumer confidence indices dipped as expected due to the fallout from COVID-19. However, business optimism took the hardest hit for the quarter, now at its lowest since the third quarter of 2015. Consumer confidence closed the second quarter down 8 points since the first quarter, and 18 points lower than the all-time high in the second quarter of 2019. Businesses hit by COVID-19 will continue to get a break on taxes until September 30. Finance Minister Dr. Nigel Clark has approved an extension to support businesses still being impacted by the pandemic. The measures were to end on June 30. However, Tax Administration Jamaica TAJ will continue to issue one-off tax compliance certificates to non-compliant businesses until September 30. No new summons will be issued, nor quit proceedings or enforcement action taken for non-compliance until October. And taxpayers with outstanding interest and penalty charges for paying or filing their taxes late may qualify for those charges to be reversed. A liminary refinery Jamalco is expected to list on the Jamaica Stock Exchange. The Hong Kong-based Noble Group and the Jamaican government have agreed to reorganize the assets and operations of Jamalco into a holding company that will raise equity capital on the stock market. The Noble Group has a 55% stake in Jamalco. The remaining 45% is owned by the Jamaican government through Clarendon Alumina Production. According to Noble's financial results, the newly incorporated Jamaican company will own and operate the assets and business. The benefits of incorporating the new holding company include the restructuring of the government's debt to the joint venture. It would also see Jamalco conducting direct alumina sales, with Noble providing marketing support. The Bank of Jamaica BOJ is inviting central bank digital currency CBDC providers to develop and test potential solutions in its new fintech regulatory sandbox. 
The announcement follows an indication earlier this year that the BOJ was willing to consider CBDC. However, the central bank says CBDC is not to be confused with cryptocurrency. CBDC is a digital form of central bank-issued currency and therefore legal tender that can be exchanged dollar for dollar with physical cash. And the Portmore branch of the Alorica Call Center, which became the epicenter of a surge in COVID-19 cases in Jamaica in April, is set to close for good. Staff at the Alorica Portmore branch were advised of the permanent closure just over a week ago, which means that some employees of the call center may soon be out of work. The company says the last few months have been challenging. What's Hot was brought to you by Jamaica Money Market Brokers, your best interest at heart. And when we come back, co-founder and executive director at Kingston Creative, Andrea Dempster-Chung, will join us. Hey everyone, I'm Chanel and I just want to share how Money Mondays JA and Taking Stock JA, which are programs hosted by Khalila Reynolds, have positively and tremendously impacted and improved my understanding of financial concepts and have played an instrumental role in me finding the path to financial wellness. So I started to watch her videos. The first video that I watched was entitled Watch This Before You Invest in Wigton Wind Farm. It was a Money Mondays JA video. So I started to watch those videos and other videos and I realized that this lady is phenomenal. Her explanation is clear. I am understanding and the content is top tier. And for that reason, I watched all the Money Mondays GA videos from before and I continued to watch Money Mondays GA up until the point that Taking Stock was launched, I began to watch both. Now, I literally set time out every week on my schedule to ensure that Taking Stock GA does not miss me. I moved from about zero to about 80% now from last year to this year. Imagine only knowing about stocks in a supermarket type setting to now being ready to invest in the stock market. This segment of Taking Stock is brought to you by Bulwark Insurance Agent. Insurance made easy. Welcome back to Taking Stock. Congratulations to Chanel Graham, the winner of last week's 20K giveaway. Contact admin at kalilaraymedia.com for details on how to claim your prize. $20,000 to invest in stocks of your choice. And of course, you can win too. All you have to do is post a video on Instagram saying how taking stock or Money Mondays JA has made a difference in your investment journey. This week is the last week I'll be doing these gift certificate giveaways. So get those videos ready and tag at Kalila Ray and at Taking Stock JA. Now to our discussion, with the rising need for creatives in various industries, a space has now been specifically designed for artists, those in the creative and cultural industries. What's the buzz about this new creative hub? Well, co-founder and executive director at Kingston Creative, Andrea Dempster-Chung, joins us. Hi, Andrea. Good to have you on. Hi, Kalila. Nice to be on. Thanks for having me. So you're officially open Kingston Creative Hub. Tell me what it is. Well, it is a co-working space. It is an office space so people can rent offices, they can co-work, they can also rent podcast studios, dance studios, animation studios. So it is a space for creatives to really develop and work on their business. And apart from just a physical space, it's all about the network. So when creatives come together and collaborate, that's where our strength is. And when we start collaborating with techies and venture capitalists and really start looking at the ecosystem, that's where the magic happens. So this is a space where all of that collaboration can happen to grow the creative economy. Interesting that you mentioned it's a, a collaboration with the hub co-working. So it really is a co-working space tailored for creatives. What types of spaces, what types of creative activities are you able to facilitate? Well, you can rent a podcast studio, so you can actually record your podcast there. You can rent a photography studio, so you can have your photo shoots there. You can also uh, rent a dance studio, so that's good for theatre people, rehearsal spaces. And what we're doing is not just... So the space, first of all, is at 107 Harbour Street, downtown Kingston, which is upstairs of the Swiss Stores building, which is a really old building, 
used to be a Rolex store, the only Rolex dealer in Jamaica back in the heyday. People used to come off the cruise ships and line up around the block to get their Rolexes. And then as times changed in downtown, it became a, a, a restaurant and cafe. So F&B downtown is what's there now. And the upstairs was just completely empty. So we've gutted it and created this co-working space with all these different nooks for different creatives. But what we're also doing is leveraging the underutilized space that exists in downtown. So we've always had this dance studio on West Street. It's been there for several years, but nobody uses it. There's an animation studio on East Street, but again, it's underutilized. And also a theater and uh, auditorium space that can seat about 300 people. So what we're doing is connecting these different spaces. So when you call the hub, you can rent these different types of spaces that are really needed by creatives. I love the concept of it. So one of the things that I'm, you know, when you think about creative people, they're not always the most consistent. Many people, many creatives work in, in spurts of inspiration. And so how do you overcome that challenge? Because the thing about starving artists, it may be cliche, but it's a reality for some too. It's a reality for some. And the way that we get out of this is by professionalizing the creative industries, by understanding that it's a business just like any other. So globally, the creative industries earns $2.253 trillion. Wow. I mean, it is growing faster. Yeah, it's growing at a faster rate than the other average industries as well. Creativity is where it's at. And for, just for an example, you know, in the UK, they earn 11.5 million pounds per hour. Every hour that God sends, they earn 11.5 million pounds from the creative economy. And so you have to really look at it and say, we are creative people, but we're just not monetizing that. That's why you have this trope of starving artists. You know, we're really not finding the connections to make it into a business, to team up with people who are business minded, to get the capital and investment, to give creatives the space they need to produce, to perform, uh, and just to, to ideate, you know? So the thing about what we're doing here is not solving all the problems in the world for creatives, but we are providing a space where there'll be lots of workshops, there'll be a business accelerator. So, you know, just like you have a tech accelerator or an incubator, we're having creative accelerators and incubators. So we're just providing that space and that resource and the networking for the creative economy in the hopes that we can grow it. You know, we're starving because we're not treating it like a business and it mm -hmm. really is big business. Absolutely. It's not a hobby. Absolutely. Yeah. So much potential to really develop Jamaica. It's so true. So, so how... What type of professional services are you going to be offering or will you offer professional services? Because I heard you say podcast, studio and different things like this. Do you have to bring your own people or you'll be providing that? We will have a list of people that are available that are part of the hub family, part of the network. So in terms of accounting, in terms of HR, in terms of digital marketing and in terms of legal. Um, but um, obviously you're able to bring your own person if you, if you want to, but we actually have somebody who is able to provide help recording your podcast. That's what he does. And he can, you know, be called upon, but we're not like forcing professionals on the people who use the hub, but there mm -hmm. is a network that you can access if you do need those, those kind of things. And it should happen organically. So Kingston creative in this partnership with hub coworking, we're kind of, we used to do a meetup. Uh, once every last Friday. So just once a month, we used to get all these people in the same space and people would be collaborating and, and you know, things would happen. This is like a 24 seven space now where that collaboration can happen. So we're really looking forward to good things. And we just want to big up DBJ, Development Bank of Jamaica is the entity that funded it through the Ignite grant. So they really saw the potential in this. And then Tourism Enhancement Fund came on board too, because having a space like this in downtown helps to make downtown a creative hub you know, of the Caribbean and of the world, we hope. But, you know, developing downtown into a space where creativity is happening and creative businesses form clusters is a really important part of transforming our city. I love that DBJ is actually funding this and that TEF is on board because it really demonstrates confidence in the creative economy. I, I, I like the entire concept of it. So if you're a, a painter, you have a dedicated space to come paint. If you're a musician, you have a space to come practice. Uh, and various things like that. A dancer, you have the dance studio available, podcasting, video. Who knows? I may even link you to come record my show there. Definitely. You'd be so welcome. <laughs> yeah. So uh, what do your rates start at? I'm sure there are people who are curious now. And how much space do you have available? 
so we have a 20 seater meeting room uh, which is 23,000 per day or 3,000 per hour so every service you can just rent by the hour uh, the podcast studio is two thousand dollars per hour uh, the dance studio three five uh, animation studio two thousand the theater space is three five and then we also have these creative display cubes um, I don't know if you noticed, but Kingston Creative has opened an artisan store in partnership with the Urban Development Corporation. It's on Ocean Boulevard, uh, shop number 210 Ocean Boulevard, facing the harbor. And that's a space for creatives who make tangible goods to have their stuff there. And there's an overflow space in the hub itself. So you can rent a cube where, you know, in Corona time, if you're working out of your house, you're making sandals. You don't necessarily want people coming to your home. Right. This is a consignment space. You pay for it by the month and people come there and pick up. So, you know, there's lots of different benefits. There's also the photography backdrop rental. That's a thousand per hour. Um, hot desking is at $500 per hour, which is super, you know, that, that's a really good rate. And the offices themselves. Are What's hot desking? What's that? So hot desking is like you don't have a permanent desk in a space, but when you come, you pick any space that's available. And there's all these little cute nooks, and the design is really nice. I have to pick up Joelle Smith from Hubco Working. She's also a design interiors person, and she's done an amazing job of the space. It looks lovely. And Becky Levy has done a fantastic mural as well. So definitely come down and check it out. It's, it's a lovely space. It really makes you feel in the mood to, you know, release those creative energies. Awesome. Oh, and one more thing in terms of rates. Um, we're really conscious that we're in downtown and there are lots of creative people who live in downtown. And so we're ensuring that they have a 50% rate on all our services. So, you know, if you're a dance troupe from Tivoli and you need to rent the, the studio, it's going to be 50% of the regular rate. So nice. we're making sure that we're being inclusive to the creatives who come from where this, this hub is placed. You know, you mentioned the, the importance of the creative economy and how much it contributes to the global economy in the UK, for example. Kingston is a creative city. I think we have that designation now by UNESCO. Jamaica sure on a whole is a, is a creative society, creative people. Yeah. Do you think that that is recognized enough and monetized enough here in Jamaica? Absolutely not. I mean, we might recognize it, but I think we trivialize it a little bit. Mm -hmm. We tend to take creatives for granted. Um, you know, the things about pricing and paying people what they're worth, but also about having the, the, the different kind of lines. So say we have a man booker prize winning author called Marlon James. Mm -hmm. He's from Portmore. But if he stayed in Jamaica and wrote his book and published it in Jamaica and distributed it from Jamaica, we would get the revenues from his book. Um, however, he lives in the U.S. Again, you have Kai Miller, who is another award-winning poet, right? Uh, but he publishes and lives in the U.K. So when we talk about, you know, do we recognize it? Sure, we recognize it. We always, you know, have these recognition ceremonies and big them up. But are we producing the music here? Are we distributing it from here? Are we, you know, when people come here and learn our dancers? So there's a big, I don't know if you know, the dance hall culture. People come here from Eastern Europe, learn mm -hmm. all the dances, go back and teach yeah. for how much, how much money. I mean, yeah. why aren't we doing that here? Downtown should be a hotbed of people just coming in and learning and the revenue staying here. So there's an ecosystem that we really have to start talking about. But I'm super happy that, um, you know, Jampro is one of our sponsors. I just think it's encouraging. You have lots of big support, man. Jampro, DBJ, TEF, uh, things are going on here. Sagicor Bank. I mean, we have to wow. start getting people thinking about this as a business and once you see the business sector really getting involved and seeing the potential of um, investment for impact in creativity then you think things are kind of changing so we're really really encouraged by the support um, and we hope to be kind of making these linkages and creating that ecosystem so when a super creative kid comes out to Ed the man they're ready to hit the world they have a space to go to they have um, people who will invest in them they are taken seriously they can find a network of people to support their business this growth you know so yeah we're hope that's what we're advocating for and we hope it's going to make you know a change in terms of national development i'm excited about this andrea i'm i'm really excited oh, for what you're doing and for you as well i wish you all the best so tell the people how they can reach you they can reach us at info at kingstoncreative.org or you can go on our website www.kingstoncreative.org to get information about the hub, the services or anything that we do. So just send us an email. Awesome. All right. Thanks, Andrea.
Thanks, Kalila. And when we come back, I've got your market recap and the analysts are standing by. This segment of Taking Stock was brought to you by Bulwark Insurance Agency. Insurance made easy. Time now for your market recap, brought to you by Sagicor Investments. Think wealth, think Sagicor Investments. The Jamaica Stock Exchange declined last week with the combined index losing 1%. 95 stocks traded across both the main and junior markets of the JSC for the week ending Friday, July 24, 2020. 40 advanced, 40 declined, and 15 stayed the same. Nearly 89 million shares changed hands on the Jamaican dollar market, totaling nearly $379 million. Select F traded the most, taking up nearly 23% of market volume. The stock stayed the same to close last week at 68 cents. Trans Jamaican Highway traded the second highest, with people buying and selling 18 million shares in the company. The stock lost 3 cents to close the week at $1.36. And JMMB Group 7.5% rounded out the week as the third most traded. Its stock lost 1 cent to start the week at 74 cents. Now let's see who had the biggest gains. Iron Rock Insurance Company rose 29% to close last week at $3.89. Consolidated Bakers Jamaica up 27% to close last week at $1.55. And rounding out the biggest gains, Cargo Handlers closed this week up 18% to $7.70. On the losing side now, Palace Amusement Company fell 11% to close last week at $1,550. Medical Disposables and Supplies fell 11 to end last week at $5.20 a share, and Blue Power Group lost 10% down to $3.40. Market Recap was brought to you by Sagicor Investments. Think wealth, think Sagicor Investments. This segment of Taking Stock, The Analysts, is brought to you by Ideal Portfolio Services. Welcome back to Taking Stock. I've got a team of analysts to examine the week in business. I'm joined by Senior Wealth Advisor at Ideal Portfolio Services, Auric Angus, and Young Investor at the University of the West Indies, David Rhodes. Hi, David. Hi, Auric. You guys looking good. David, I like the hat. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> So a few, things, a few things that we have our eye on this week, both locally and internationally. David, I noticed that there is what you've termed a capital market resurgence. What do you mean by that? In your interview in the street first in January, there was indication for 20 IPOs for this year. However, due to COVID, only three have gone through so far, basically only three listings, while you basically had proven APO chapter because of the whole equity market decline and overall effect restrictions. But in recent times, companies, listed companies in particular, have been coming to market for fresh capital. So unlike where we've been seeing in the past with numerous IPOs introducing new capital to the market, instead, you are seeing existing companies on the market coming to shareholders and extension to the public to raise more capital. So the most recent company to actually give this indication is Sterling Investments Limited. So in their annual general meeting notice, they have a particular resolution relating to the issuance of 1 billion shares. Sterling Investments Limited is trading around $2.90 right now. So even if a dollar per share argument said that's at least a billion dollars. And this is just coming off the heels of Barita announcing their APU range price, which puts them between 9.6 billion and caught about $16 billion in capital they want to target for a raise. And there also the case with Panjam, who is waiting on their age in September to consider their own APU. And First Rock, which actually listed this year in their actual press process, said that they want to do a rights issue during this year. But we're not sure if they're going to instead choose by APU, considering the whole event situation. So this is what I'm talking about the whole capital markets resurgence, meaning that in the second quarter to come in, basically from the first, there was a decline in general activity for equity capital. But now you're having to see greater aggressiveness by some companies to raise capital to potentially 
by other companies, export operations, and have aggressive uh, steals in this case, because there are several undervalued assets, not just necessarily on the stock exchange, but even real estate and other asset classes. Mm -hmm. So, Auric, this is a this is a good sign, is it not, that these companies are now seeing it fit, seeing that the time is right to come back. All of these IPOs, APOs, all of these capital raises that had been delayed because of COVID, uh, companies are now saying, okay, mm, now might be a good time to test the waters and jump back in. It has been restoring some confidence into the capital market, um, obviously through the, the existing listings that we have. Um, we're still trying to find out when is the best time to bring the, the newer companies, the fresh um, listings to, to market. Um, we're still not at that stage yet, but in the meantime, um, the existing opportunities, the existing listing on the market is trying to um, use the opportunity to boost some confidence into the market. I saw an article recently as well in one of the papers about Jamalco uh, to make right. preparations to go to IPO. Uh, David, what do you think about the, the prospects for a Jamalco listing on the stock exchange? Do you think that's something that Jamaicans might warm towards given how the industry for bauxite alumina has fluctuated over the years and that has struggled? From what I understand, even as a chemistry person, uh, the pressing of, of uh, certain metals or compounds in Jamaica is prohibitively expensive, mainly due to electricity costs associated with the processes. And the fact that uh, the closure of the box tech sector and dragging the economies over, as we call it, GDP growth, when it recently closed, uh, Jamaica closed. It's pretty, I shouldn't say it's not necessarily a bad opportunity for them to consider listing this asset through the, with the GOJ being the part owner, but it's still a very high risk considering that the global prices are fluctuating and it's already an expensive operation to, so, as you could say, break even for a profit because the golden days of box set in the 80s and 90s, I should say 70s, gave us good opportunity in the country, good foreign exchange and every other benefit you associate with the uh, use the natural resources. But in the current day, it's a very difficult day because as we're seeing right now, the commodity prices are taking significant hits. Some other commodities are rising, but at least the bauxite, the cost itself is what's making the operation relatively tricky to basically generate significant and meaningful profits for any owner. Auric, what are your thoughts on a potential Jamalco listing? Is it something that you'd be interested in or not really? I mean, not really. Um, David, I just cover the, the cost and the risk associated with that. Um, but all in all, even though I'm not for it, it's still a good opportunity for the development of the, the stock exchange itself as it brings more um, investment options to, to our citizens. So, for example, um, as we build out the infrastructure and the, the, the market um, to bring more diversity, um, we're going, we are going to have more um, infrastructure assets such like Wigton and Transjam come into the market. Um, this would consider as a form of commodity um, segment of the market. So it brings about diversity. Um, on top of that, it also helps to unlock, unlock um, liquidity that has been tied up for years. It also is a major opportunity for the government to, to restructure their debt as well. So um, there are positives and there are there are negatives from my hand, but overall, I say it's a fairly decent um, opportunity that should surface whenever it does. David, I see some impressive results being posted by Seprod recently. Tell me about that. So Seprod posted a $1 billion increase in their revenue, and for the overall quarter, they posted a 135% increase in their profit. But that's including the discontinued operations of the Golden Group operation. If you were to just so from the continued operations perspective, net profit, I mean, net profit up by 35%, which is still impressive, considering that a part of that $1 billion increase in revenue for separate, you actually saw that there was a near what separate actually had export sales totaling nearly $1 billion. 
and this is in the time of when you had lockdowns, you had high on economic uncertainty, the whole FX situation for different companies in terms of sourcing FX to their transactions. So to see a company like Sephora thrive during what one would call the worst performing quarter for the for the year so far is actually pretty impressive. It didn't be quarter one, but the fact that they actually thrived during, as I said, all these uneconomic variables or factors that should have resulted in certain declines in transactions, that they actually thrived, they're actually pretty impressive. And they started to export to Trinidad recently with the surge milk. And Mr. Pando, he, the CEO, actually attributed the prospects of actually getting that good football in Trinidad market. Well, I'm not, I'm not necessarily surprised as you are at Steprod's growth over the COVID period, given some of the things that they manufacture, like milk, wholesome products of food items being on their list. And in COVID, people were stocking up on food items, eating out less, eating home more, so buying more items for consumption at home and cooking more. So Steprod would have been poised to take advantage of that. We not only look at investments here, primarily we talk about investments in Jamaica on this program, but I want to start looking at some, you know, international happenings as well. And I know they're at Ideal Portfolio Services. You do offer that service. So tell me what's going on in the U.S. market. We're in the midst of the earnings season right now. Um, things have been a little bit better um, than we have, than most analysts would have expected. Um, it is not as bad as uh, as it should have been. Um, we had expect earnings to fall off at around forty, between forty to forty four percent this season. Um, oh, wow, that the much. Tech numbers, yeah, and the tech company numbers are not even fully in yet. Um, as it relates to Tesla, Tesla have, have been doing extremely well. They have posted their fourth straight consecutive quarterly profits and net profits for the last quarter was north of 100 million, 104 million to be exact. The company, in my opinion, is very much poised for growth. Um, in my opinion, it's a green company and there is no better way to, to earn money while trying to save the environment. So a lot of investors are gravitating towards that. Um, Tesla have came into an industry that was very ripe, very mature, um, and they were able to to create a niche in that market or in or in a, if you look at it from another perspective they pretty much create a mark a segment of the market for themselves where where electric vehicles are concerned um, the company's strategy um, going forward is very aggressive so we we know that um, the the numbers for the coming quarters might my, they, they might look well, they might not, because it will require a lot of capital injection into the company. In addition to that, um, the bigger players in the, in the motor vehicle industry, they're, when they're going to come in on that as well. And they're going to, based on their supply chain and stuff right now, they should be able to capture a, a bit of that market share. But um, Tesla still is a first mover in that segment of the market. They have a major advantage. The company, as I said before, is, it is poised for growth. They are looking in, they are now serving B business to customer market. And if they're, they're able to grow their supply chain and focus on business to business, then that can be a massive game changer for them as well, because they're right they right now they're trying to to innovate their their motor vehicle or the model um, to introduce the pickup trucks. And I think that is a market for business to attract business customers. So that should boost the company's revenue. Um, for long term growth, they're looking at Tesla homes, um, solar solar roofs, solar walls. So stuff like that. There's a lot of stuff in play that we can look at, but the growth comp the growth potential for this company is long term and obviously there are short term benefits that should come with it because it's new, it's innovative and it should attract shareholder value for some time. Sound like you're excited about Tesla Auric. I don't know, David, I to what extent you've been to what extent you've been following Tesla, David? Well, there's a good colleague of mine on Twitter 
he always chose Tesla just because Tesla is still a drunk stock because it's up 200%. Elon Musk is on the top 10 billionaires in the world. As Eric mentioned, their fourth quarter of profit has technically just given them the opportunity to actually be including the S&P 500, right. which is right. basically an index representing the largest of companies in America, representing the interests and values. So the fact that Tesla actually hit this milestone to actually potentially be including the S&P 500 is pretty, not actually surprising, but quite Amazing. phenomenal in the reality that yeah. This is a company that is over $300 million now based on the market cap by more than any other, other motor vehicle entities. Yeah, but, see where they recently surpassed Toyota. And Ford. Yeah. yeah. I just, it's, Tesla is, and I'm, I'm going to be honest, Tesla is, is on two extremes. You have persons mm-hmm. who are seeing the entire scam, others who are betting on the whole long term growth. You know, there was a chance with uh, discussing Tesla's situation between what is real, what is not, uh, what is potential growth or not. But the reality is that they're in a space where they have greater command as the world is trying to transition to cleaner energy and reduce carbon emissions. So even Germany is setting a goal within the 2030 or 2040 timeline actually ban all diesel vehicles. So. Tesla has that as a as a, I shouldn't say the first move advantage directly, but they have a greater presence in the space of electric vehicles. And as Eric mentioned, they're trying to push on to more business lines such as autonomous driving, which is still a relatively new field. But what they're trying to do in that space is allow for your vehicle to actually drive itself without you having to be Manual, doing using manual control. I have one that's turning around actually pressing the gas or the pedal in this case. And what they actually want to do is have another business model where you could actually rent out your car instead of it being parked entirely in the parking lot. You could actually just uh, put it, put, I make it available for autonomous driving to service as a taxi in general space. And that's just one company. Here's the question, though, as well as they've performed, and g- even given all that background that both of you just gave, this is the, the big question. Is that stock price of over 1,400 US dollars for one stock at Tesla, is that justified based on their performance and their results, Auric? Is it overvalued? Um, um, I still think it is. it is not fully fairly priced in. Um, I wouldn't say it's um, overvalued based on the company's strategy and based on the numbers that I'm look, we're, we're crunching right now. Um, at at, at that, it, that price, it does sound a little too expensive. Um, but if you're investing for long term or you're looking for long term growth, then it's a no brainer to me. That's just my opinion. David, what do you think? Well, it's all relative from your perspective. In mm-hmm. reality, that persons are say, persons were saying also locally that NTV at nineteen dollars was expensive and it went to two hundred. Your reality with Tesla is that Tesla is what you'd call a dark horse. Like you literally cannot tell what's going to happen because retail investors are panning onto the stock, and you have so many persons who are gearing for Tesla. You tell you're bullish for it. The devaluation adds. I can't remember the name immediately. There's a professor at the third school. He actually says that at $1,500, Tesla can be justified around that range, but any higher would is not necessarily, as you would say, purely valued. He considers it over, overvalued. And Tesla is trying to run $1,600 US right now. Mm-hmm. So it all comes down to what is your long term advantage or play. And what you see, because someone just recently said that two years ago there were Amazon at the phone, two Amazon shares, the energy yeah. piece. And Perfect it's at like $3,000 now. So, my person is saying that stocks are expensive. It all comes down to the context of can they continue to deliver growth and expand its new business lines while delivering shareholder value that will further incentivize persons to actually buy the stock. Mm. Because right now, this is in, in quote unquote growth phase. So, they are dividend right now. It is putting them to continue driving further sales and continuing to actually capture the market space of this transition from 
or traditional diesel food diesel vehicles and towards more electronic electric and clean cleaner means to travel around the world because as i said right now we're trying to cut back on emissions and become cleaner and one final point on the whole international market the tech players are actually driving the whole s p 500 right now so based on, based on jim kramer's research uh, around two thirds of the S&P 500 is actually down for the year, but the overall index is up, and that's mainly due right. to the Apple's, the uh, Google, the Microsoft's, those large cap companies which have been driving significant growth in their share price, which have basically represent nearly more than probably two fifths of the bottom S&P 500. So there's an inverse correlation in the in the U.S. market right now, driven by the big tech stocks, while the other components of S&P 500 take a hit as the as persons diversify their income or their portfolios towards potential growth companies, especially the pharmaceuticals in this big vaccine race. Mm. Before we go, Auric, uh, people mm -hmm. often ask me about the possibility of investing in stocks abroad, on the U.S. markets in particular. Tell me about the, the service that Ideal Portfolio Services offers there. How can people access that service? Yeah, you can simply access that service through us through opening accounts, in, similar to how you would have opened a, a JL Dollar stock account here. We have access to all the global platforms through our partners, Interactive Broker, which is um, located in, in Chicago. Um, so you're able to access any company that is listed um, for trading and that we recommend to the New York Stock Exchange, NAS NASDAQ, um, Toronto um, Stock Exchanges over in Europe and in Asia. So we have access to all of those platforms. Um, the minimum to open a U.S. stock account is $500, uh, 500 U.S. dollars that is, and um, we also trade in Canadian currency, as I said before, um, pounds, euros. So it's based on, on on what each individual is looking for. We tailor those um, investment re investment recommendations across the various markets. Awesome. Thanks for joining me, guys. Thank you. Thanks Have a great evening. Enough. Yeah, man. Bye-bye. Let's take our final break. I've got giveaways coming up. In this segment of Taking Stock, The Analysts was brought to you by Ideal Portfolio Services. That's our show for this week. Thanks for watching. Make sure you like this video, subscribe to this channel, and share with a friend. Also, subscribe to our newsletter at takingstock-ja.com and turn on those post notifications so that you can be the first to see all my other features. The goal is to get to 50,000 subscribers. We want to help people learn more about money so we can all get this money together. This week on Money Mondays JA, we take a detailed look at Barita Investments ahead of their APO next month. And on Money Moves JA with Exim Bank, we're telling you about some new offers from Exim that you can apply for. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Kalila Ray and follow at Taking Stock JA on Instagram. If you want to connect with the analysts this week, check the description box below for their contact information. Now, congratulations to last week's t-shirt winner, Micah McHale. Hey, Micah. Email admin at kalilaraymedia.com to collect your prize. And if the rest of you are jealous, here's your chance to win. So here's the question. On last week's episode of Taking Stock, what type of company did Zachary Harding say Delta Cap had already acquired in the United States? Leave your answer in the comments section. You have until Friday, July 31 to watch the episode if you haven't already and find the answer. I'll announce the winner in next week's episode. If you simply want to order a t-shirt, email admin at kalilaraymedia.com. They're only 2,500 Jamaican dollars or 20 US. Also guys, post your videos stating how Money Monday's JA or taking stock has impacted your investment journey and you could win a $20,000 gift certificate to invest in stocks of your choice. 
Post your videos on Instagram and tag me at Kalila Ray as well as at TakingStockJA and you could be featured in an upcoming episode of the show and wish to win some cash money. Tell a friend about taking stock. Investing is the new sexy, so let's make it cool to talk about money. I'm Kalila Reynolds. Stay safe.